Welcome to Black Health Matters. I'm Daryl Armistead, your host. This episode is a Zoom recording of Howard University group session led by Dr. Clive Callender. And I tell you, it's nothing like uh, having trouble with your feet because if you can't walk around and, and, and be pain free, it, it, it makes your life pretty miserable. And so uh, he's a special doctor to me because without him, I couldn't be doing many of the things that I do. And he takes care of me so well that, uh, uh, and he's presented before, but uh, 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 he's a doctor who I've uh, worked with for too many years to relate, because then you know uh, how old he is. Uh, but uh, anyway, he's a podiatrist who actually was one of the, uh, the, the first uh, black podiatrists who was actually on the board of the American Podiatry Group. and. Uh, He's been a leader in many ways, but uh, the area in which he excels, not only as a father of a daughter who's now in medical school, but also uh, as a, uh, a special podiatrist who is excellent in mm -hmm. taking care of me. So without further ado, we've heard him before, but we'll listen to him again. He talked to us about how to keep our feet healthy and uh, uh, what are the do's and don'ts. Okay, Dr. Kirk Jeter, the floor is yours. Good morning, good morning. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Good. Good. Yep, your audio is fine. I missed that uh, that recipe. I have to get that. Uh, I came in in the <laughs> middle of uh, that breakfast recipe. <laughs> um, I'm not sure how you want me to do this, just talk or... I have a your pleasure. PowerPoint, um, but I don't PowerPoint know how to you did up. before and uh, you can do again, but it, it, I don't uh, know how to hook it up from 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 here is what I'm saying. Oh, OK, John, tell him how to do it. Will you? Uh, yeah, you just uh, pull your PowerPoint up first on your on your computer. Uh -huh. And after you pull it up, then you can go to the green button at the bottom where it says share screen. And then once you hit that button at the bottom that says share screen, then another window will come up and your document will be in that smaller window. And then you, there we go, we're getting it. You got it. There it is. Very good. Good. There we go. Yes, sir. Well, it's a pleasure to be here to talk with you all again. I try to do things a little bit different than I did the last time, um, but we're going to look at some different facts and some tips that will help you moving forward. And also with the summer coming up, try to give uh, information about some pedicures and some other things as far as do's and don'ts go. Um, according to the statistics for our organization, 75% of Americans will experience some form of uh, foot problem in their life. Uh, in my case, I see more people that seem to have it over and over again. And as you, <laughs> as you can imagine, women would be four times more likely to have problems than men, mainly because of hormonal changes as they go on in life, as well as their shoe structure. Uh, this is a topic that's been coming up lately uh, about falls. Um, it seems to be significant in our communities. And as you could imagine, as we get older, um, the risk of falls increases and one in four individuals 65 or older will, will fall each year. So what you can do is you can ask yourself, um, are you at risk for a fall? Um, did you fall last year? Are you taking any kinds of medications that may make you sleepy, confused, or lightheaded? Some high blood pressure medicines can do that. Uh, is your vision impaired? Uh, do you have diabetes or some other comorbidity that may affect your vision? Do you have cataracts? 
Uh, those things can make you at risk for falls. Um, do you have a history of foot injury or have you recently had surgery? Um, do you have any, any weaknesses in your lower extremity? Have you had a stroke recently? Uh, do you have arthritis in your knees or any part of your lower extremity? These can make you have balance issues and make you at risk for a fall. So if the answer to any of those questions is yes, then you're at risk for a fall. And you can see from this slide that 50, the fifth leading cause of death in the United States is related to falls in older Americans, which is kind of significant. So if you're at risk, what can you do? Um, take a look around your house, your floors, uh, the stairways, the halls. Do you have rails on both sides of your stairs? Um, do you have clutter in and around the area where you might fall on the floor? Um, some carpets have uh, backing to help them not slip, but is your carpet fixed to the floor? Um, those things can make it easy for you to slip and fall. Um, does your bathroom have uh, grab bars if, if necessary or something if you need to push up or get in and out of the shower? Um, do you have non-skid mats um, in your bathtub or on the floor? Um, your bedroom, is your bed close to, to lighting? Uh, is there a flashlight near if um, power goes out? And uh, do you have your cell phone charged or your phone in case uh, power goes out as well? I see a lot of people who get up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom and hit their toe in the corner of their, uh, their bed and wind up uh, breaking their toe. So you wanna keep an eye, a clear path to you to the bathroom, especially if you have to get up in the middle of the night. Switching gears a little bit, all of us um, should examine our feet daily, whether if the morning is good for you or the nighttime is whatever works for you. Daily inspection is very important. Um, looking for any kind of irregularity, any redness, cracks, in your skin, uh, any pressure point areas that you can see. If you have a problem um, bending over, uh, you can sit down and cross your leg and use a handheld mirror so you can see um, under the bottom of your foot because a lot of times people have a hard time seeing the bottom of their foot. You can use a handheld mirror that works really well. Um, in this day and age, we still see individuals who have gotten scolded uh, from putting their foot in uh, water that's too hot, you want to test it with your elbow um, to make sure that the temperature of the water is good. They also have some things that you could throw in the tub. They're like little balls that uh, the color will change if it's, uh, if it's too hot. Um, so those are things that you can look at too to, to help prevent scalding from hot water. Um, moisturize your feet. Everybody's in a rush, but you want to moisturize the top and the bottom of your feet. Um, what's a good moisturizer? Uh, Gold Bomb makes a, a relatively inexpensive, very good moisturizer for your feet and your hands as well. You want to keep between your toes dry. Um, a lot of bacteria can build up and fungal infections in between the toes. And you want to make sure that you wear a cotton or a wool blend type of sock. Um, a lot of days, nowadays, people want to go without socks, but that's not a good thing to, to do because of bacteria that builds up in and around the foot. Did anybody walk this morning? Oh, one person after they ate breakfast, two people. <laughs> Walking is important. Um, you want to make sure we'll talk about footwear in a little bit and uh, good shoes to, to walk in but you wanna stay on um, constant terrain. You don't wanna switch from different surfaces when you're walking. Um, a lot of people walk in their community, that's fine. Or walking around the track is, is good too. Uh, Self-care, obviously smoking is a no-no. Uh, I see a large percentage of diabetics um, and we try to make sure that they eat properly, check their blood sugar regularly. And for some reason, every diabetic wants to go around barefoot. And um, that's a, a no-no as well. We'll see why in a minute. Again, inspect your feet daily. Um, 
we suggest antibacterial soaps more so than over-the-counter soaps. And you can see from this diabetic, they broke off a sewing needle in their foot because they were walking around the house uh, barefoot. So again, it's important to keep your feet covered. Um, most people want to walk around barefoot. Um, and then if you have a home that has uh, wooden floors, uh, sometimes the splinters from the floors get uh, in the person's foot too. So you must be careful about that as well. When I first started doing this, the number was around 20. So now it's 37.3 Americans in the United States have diabetes and the number for pre-diabetics keeps going up too. Um, and in 2017, it was estimated that $327 billion was used for indirect and direct cost of, um, from diabetes. Um, that would leave a little bit more money for someone to uh, by the commanders if they were so inclined to buy a sorry football team, but um, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> As you can imagine, um, African Americans uh, are hit hard by diabetes. 18.7% over the age of 20 have um, diabetes and one in four uh, African American women over 55 years of age have diabetes. It's interesting because most of the time, the patients I see here at Howard, the males are the ones, African-American males are the ones more likely to get complications from the diabetes in the lower extremity than the female. I do more male uh, lower extremity amputations as opposed to uh, females getting in trouble from diabetes. Um, again, I think this number of 2.7 is going up we've noticed that the complications from diabetes have significantly increased during the, uh, the pandemic, uh, more so because people were not going out, exercising, were not, uh, they were more sedentary. So their sugar levels were going up. They weren't being followed by their physician as regularly as you think. So now we're starting to see a backlash of that with the complications uh, arising because of that. So the significance of of healthcare is continues to be paramount. Again, you can see from 2007, the impact was 174 billion and in 2017, it's jumped to 327 billion. So diabetes continues to be in the forefront of causing complications in the lower extremity. So what can you do about that? Well. Some research has been done to show that a comprehensive foot exam by a professional can reduce the rate of complications from 45 to 85%, which is pretty significant if you look at it. And usually the patients that we see every two to three months are the ones that uh, tend to not have trouble or complications related to their diabetic process. Dr. Callender, that's a picture that Kaylin drew when she was probably three or four. <laughs> What about the transplant patient? Um, as far as my perspective is concerned, our biggest concern is wound problems with the individual developing a wound after having a transplant and being able to um, actually heal that wound and also infection. Even something as simple as an athlete's foot or a fungal or bacterial infection can put the transplant patient at risk. Um, so we tend to work very well and have worked well with. Uh, transplant services uh, in relationship to keeping their patients uh, moving and, and doing right so that their transplant does not become at risk. Another consideration that we've been looking at is patients who have diabetes or post-transplant patients is making sure that their bone stock is adequate too. Um, as we get older, all of us are prone to osteoporotic changes in our bone structure. And because our feet tend to take three or four times our body weight, um, it, it can put a significant uh, impact on an individual, especially when they're trying to keep their weight down and they're walking. So we'll look at some shoes that can help with that uh, in a minute. Common foot problems, I always get asked about toe fungus, ingrown nails, foot odor, especially with the summer months coming up. And most of the the elective surgery that we do is related to bunions or hammer toes. So we'll talk about that in a second. I've been doing this for over 30 years and 
I'm not really sure if there's anything that really works to get rid of toenail fungus. We've used everything from Vicks Vapor Rub to tea tree oil to prescription medications to um, apple cider vinegar. Um, the best thing to do is don't get it in the first place. Um, it is a continued problem to deal with. Uh, some of the newer treatments, the laser treatments are not working as well and most insurances do not cover uh, laser care. Uh, ingrown toenails, obviously I see those a lot, but it tends to be in the younger population that's overweight. Um, they tend to cut their toenail too short. The general rule is to cut your toenail straight across, but everyone is a little bit different. So sometimes based on the anatomy of their toe uh, can create a problem. You can see from the slide at the bottom that uh, that individual has a slight bacterial infection with the ingrown nail. The body does not realize or recognize that the nail is a part of it. So when it gets into the flesh, it treats it as an infectious process. And that's a procedure that's usually done in the office quite readily. Foot odor is a big problem. Um, they make uh, socks now that are called drip dry socks, especially those individuals who raise their hand about walking. Um, any of the sporting goods stores, they're called drip dry socks. So they wick the moisture away from, from your foot. My foot sweats a lot, so I have to stay in them. Um, I'm not a cornstarch fan, but uh, any perspirant, uh, deodorant spray will work well if your foot sweats a lot or has an odor. You just wanna make sure that uh, the antiperspirant has aluminum chlorhydrate in it and that you have no cracks or cuts in your skin. Um, but that works very well uh, also. Bunion deformity is, uh, I see this mainly in women more, as you can see from the narrow toe box, um, 20 to 25% of a bunion deformity can be hereditary, but usually the person comes in complaining of shoe problems. Uh, wider shoes will help, a surgery will, will help as well in individuals um, depending on the person's health status and all, um, uh, procedures are basic and usually takes about four weeks, uh, post-op care to heal. Um, seeing it a lot more in kids now recently, for some reason, I'm not really sure why though. Hammer toe, um, thanks to Eddie Murphy's movie, uh, we got really busy when he was, uh, dating that woman and he pulled back the covers and saw that she had hammer time. And so all, all females were coming in to get their feet fixed based on his movie. Um, but it can be a problem in the shoe. It uh, tends to affect women more than men because men tend to wear wider shoes. Uh, the contracture pushes up and creates a problem. Um, we'll do this as a preventative measure, even in diabetics or patients with other comorbidities as long as their numbers are, are well so that they don't go on to develop a, a wound in that area. Uh, but the, the surgery is, is what one would consider minor if one considers a surgical procedure minor. Pedicures, um, I get asked this all the time. Uh, I constantly see people who have gone to get a pedicure and develop a fungal infection in their nails. I think the main reason is because the uh, places where they go are not sterilizing the instruments. So I tell my patients, even my daughter, I buy them a, a pedicure kit. You can get one on Amazon. Um, that's relatively inexpensive, 20 to $30. And to take their own instruments, as well as bring their own nail polish, because you don't know who was there before you. Um, women who go, I advise them if they shave their legs to not shave their legs before they go because they, they soak their feet. And then um, if they have uh, any bacteria in the water, uh, they're subject to uh, having some problems as well as uh, individuals who have comorbidities. I'm not a, against it. It's just that I think they treat you totally different if you come in there with uh, your own instrument. So what about the summer? Summer's coming up. Uh, you wanna limit going barefoot. The biggest thing I see in the summer months 
Um, and you'd be surprised if people get sunburned in their feet. Um, so you wanna make sure that you use a sunscreen on your feet, especially if you go to the beach or to a woman that's wearing sandals and is out and about should put sunscreen on uh, their feet because I have seen it happen. Um, and if you go to the beach, uh, you probably should wear the shoes because I've seen people to get second degree burns, um, especially down in the climates closer to the equator. Um, from the sand being so hot. Uh, so you got to keep that in mind. Um, during COVID, I felt that the virus was being transmitted to uh, from the soles of the feet. So I started cleaning my soles of my feet, spraying them with Lysol when I came home. Um, and I still do that um, because I think that the bacteria you take into your house and then you walk around and it makes you susceptible to it. So consider that women or individuals who wear sandals during the summer, I try to tell them to use antibacterial wipes uh, to wipe their feet off when they come in the house because they've been outside and there's all kind of bacteria on the ground. So they just take their sandals off and walk around in their house. Um, and so I think they're just transmitting bacteria and fungus around in their home environment as well. So you wanna clean the soles of your shoes and the bottom of your feet when you come in if you wear sandals. Shoes, um, I'm not a big fan of telling people what to wear. I just try to guide them on what not to wear if uh, they have certain issues. Women with narrow heels, if they wanna wear a dress shoe, tend to do better with a sling back. Um, as opposed to a regular shoe. Um, I'm a fan of a running shoe or a cross trainer for individuals who walk. Uh, the older population who has uh, may have arthritis in their hands and all uh, do better with uh, the Velcro straps as opposed to the laces in the shoes. Um, so what about if you wanna go and buy shoes? Uh, when's the best time to to try to get shoes uh, later in the day after you've been walking around, moving around is the best time of day to get shoes, not first thing, because your feet tend to swell as the day goes on. So that's a good indication if the shoe feels well, then that it'll feel well the rest of the time. And you wanna always have your feet measured when you go and you wanna pick the shoe for the activity. Um, if you're gonna be walking and you want a uh, a tennis shoe, if you're gonna be doing something else and you want a shoe that meets the appropriate activity. Um, this, this test was designed, the one, two, three test was designed for kids, but it works for adults too. Uh, you can see that the back part, the first, you want a stiff kind of uh, heel counter where when you pinch it, um, it has memory and it comes back. If you can pinch it and it goes all the way, then that shoe is probably not a stable shoe um, you want to check the flexibility. You can see um, the number two where the check mark is that the person is actually trying to squeeze the shoe together, but it's a firm shoe, so it has good firmness in it. The other one is too flexible, so the individual can uh, develop some problems with that. And the, the last one, number three, is that the shoe should have some rigidity to it where it's not easily to twist the shoe back and forth. Um, and this works with adults too. Uh, women's shoes, flats, and sandals tend to not do well with this test, um, but that's when I try to suggest to them that the shoe have a, a thicker sole that will help to offset some of that instability. So if your feet hurt, don't ignore them. Something's going on to let you know. Um, during COVID, we started having patients that couldn't go out to do exercises. Uh, if you or somebody you know is someone that doesn't move around that much, they can do exercises from a chair where they put their feet flat on the ground and then lift their heel up and do that back and forth, back and forth, to also wiggle their toes and move their ankles back and forth. That'll help to, to improve the circulation and push the blood flow back uh, from a stagnant position. Uh, so we started having people doing home exercises and they found that to be very beneficial. Even while you all are sitting down, 
you can wiggle your toes inside your shoes and that'll help to push because you've been we've been sitting for a few minutes so those things can help uh especially as we get younger and younger so daily foot inspection um ask yourself is your home fall proof uh, do you have any other medical conditions high blood pressure um, kidney disease, uh, transplant patient, poor circulation, obesity? Are you exercising? Are you doing the things that you need to do on a daily basis um, to keep yourself uh, healthy and safe as far as your feet are concerned? Um, I think that's my pretty much my story. I thought this was interesting. I had this from a couple years ago. These are the individuals with diabetes by wards in DC, as you can see, ward eight is the highest um, and ward five and seven follow right behind um, with places where diabetes is rampant in the District of Columbia. So if you have any questions or anything I can do to help, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Thanks so we're open for cool. questions now. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Jita. Very comprehensive overview. Um, my question is um, related. I, uh, first, I wanted to tell you that uh, you saw a patient, my sister, uh, a couple months ago, and I wanted to give you an update on how she's doing. Uh, okay. Fortunately, she had to have part of her toe amputated. So will you uh, talk a little bit about amputation? Could you, you can take the slides now. I don't know how to do, it's not, it's not moving. Oh, there we go. Is that better? You have to stop, stop the share. Yeah, I'll do that, I'll do that. Okay. There we go. Okay, great. Now, amputations. Amputations, um, from my perspective, most of the individuals who have amputations have diabetes or compli uh, combination of diabetes and peripheral vascular disease. Um, the vessels become closed in and the individual over time can lose blood flow to the area of their foot because it's so far away from the rest of their body. Um, most of the times the amputation is because the area is infected um, or has become infected. Um, the, the key though is to make sure that post amputation or prior to the amputation, that there's some mechanism to reestablish blood flow to the area so that it doesn't one toe, two toe, three toes, half the foot and the leg. That's the key part. Um, to, so we work close with the vascular doctors here to make sure. Now, there's some indications when the patient may have a really bad infection. So we have to go ahead and remove the part and then go back to talk to the vascular surgeon. But most of the time, we work in concert with them uh, to establish that. Did I answer your question? You did. Dr. Atto, you are recognized. Yeah, All right. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for a very good uh, presentation. <clears throat> uh, I enjoyed it very, very, very well. Uh, I have uh, some a question, so to say. Um, foot care and uh, going barefoot, the correlation. Uh, in my own case, I never wore any shoes until I was 14 years old. In uh, my country, most people, you know, uh, children, they don't wear shoes until, you know, they grow up, maybe um, to adulthood. Farmers in my town, never wore shoe and they live up to 80 years. Uh, people only wear shoes, those who can afford them, you know, to church. They buy one shoe, like not an expensive shoe, 
they buy um, uh, like slippers or sandals and wear it only for church. And um, people walk barefooted. Children play tennis, basketball, uh, soccer, barefoot. So I, I'm wondering, you know, what do you think is the secret to their foot longevity? You know, uh, working barefoot all their life, farming barefoot all their life. But they, they never have problem with their feet. Do you have any idea as to what might be the reason? No, but it sounds like a great research project. <laughs> 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 um, because uh, 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 that's interesting because the soil has so many different organisms in it now. Okay. And also, uh, Playing certain activities uh, put stresses on um, on the bones and all. Um, I'd be interested to see something that looked at a, a younger person and then followed them through over time to see if, in fact, anything did develop over time versus uh, what you're saying. Because uh, I don't have an answer for that, and I usually have an answer for everything. At least that's what I've been told by some people. Yeah. Mary Ellen, you are recognized. You have to unmute, man. Mary Ellen, you got to unmute. Thank you. Okay. I have, um, thank you, doctor, for that presentation. Yes, ma'am. Mary Ellen, once again, unmute. I'm sorry, unmute. Okay, is it on now? You're good. I'm good now. Yes, yes ma'am. Okay, I have um, I have a uh, diabetes, uh, type two diabetes, PAD, and I have neuropathy in my foot. But now I'm having plantar fasciitis, and I have a insert, but I can't get an insert that is good all the time because what, what my problem is instead of having continual pain, I have stabbing pains. You know, they it's painful and then it stops. But I need to know what causes plantar fasciitis and what else you can do, do for it uh, as opposed to having to get those shots. Well, you have to be careful about getting the shots too because the cortisone can increase your blood sugar levels. So you have to be careful okay. about that. Um, plantar fasciitis is um, um, the heel has a band of tissue that attaches to it and that's called the plantar fascia. And that plantar fascia can become swollen or inflamed where it attaches to your heel. So that's, that's what plantar fasciitis is, usually associated with a person who has a flat foot or yeah, a, I do. A, a lack of an arch. Um, yeah. The other thing that may be kind of throwing it off a little bit is the diabetic neuropathy because the symptoms of the neuropathy can sometimes mirror other things too. Um, a lot of times you can do stretching exercises. You can use, um, uh, take a water bottle and put water in it, put it in the freezer and let it ice up, put a towel down and while you're sitting down relaxing to roll, take the, the bottle so it's it's this way and your foot is going this way mm -hmm. and roll it oh, back okay. and forth underneath it. That will help to stretch mm -hmm. that fascia because it wants to stretch, but it's not elastic. So it okay. creates a problem. So when you're sitting or lying down, before you get up, take your foot, move it back and forth, wiggle your toes some and stretch it before you get up. It'll take that little burn away that you mm -hmm. feel when you when you're starting to to step down so it, it, it keep in mind that it's not elastic but it wants to be elastic so that's what makes it uncomfortable okay okay uh, thank you doctor you're very welcome no other questions 
Good afternoon, everyone. Okay. Oh, it's still morning. Good morning. <laughs> uh -huh. Hi. Um, again, uh, thank you, Doctor, for that presentation. I was a little late coming on, but I enjoyed what I heard. But um, my question has to do with drop foot. Uh, I recently had um, hip replacement surgery, and as a result, I ended up with a drop foot. And I'm wondering um, what you can tell me about it. I mean, I'm going, I'm doing therapy, but um, I'm just interested in, I had one hip replaced and didn't get it. And I, I'm just kind of, it's new to me. I'm just kind of interested since I have a foot specialist on, I thought I would ask the question. Sure. Uh, drop foot is usually caused by some, uh, diminished activity within the nerves that cover the foot. Um, has the physical therapy helped any? Not, not that much. I just really started though. So okay. Okay. I had Did the you... surgery in February, but I just really started the um, because of getting appointments and stuff. I just really started the um, uh, therapy. Uh, on a regular basis a couple of weeks ago. Well, they have uh, other braces too. I would wait until I finish the process with the therapy to see how much gain you can get uh, with your walking. Are you using some assistance, a cane or something too? To yeah, walk? right. Well, I'm on a cane in the house and when I go out, I use a walker. Okay, okay. I would complete the physical therapy and see how much gain you're going to get before moving forward to see if you're going to require any other assistance to help with ambulation. Okay, the, the doctor did um, instruct me to get a brace. So I did just go get fitted for a brace. Yes. Okay, okay. So okay. Um, I'll see how that does. Mm -hmm. Is it a hard brace or a soft one? Uh, it's hard, I think. Okay, yeah. okay. Hard brace. Okay. Dr. Atto. Okay, yes. One more question, uh, doctor. Uh, often at times, uh, a doctor, a food doctor advises, or let me be specific, they advised him, you know, he advised my, my wife not to wash uh, in between her toes with soap. I was wondering why, is it? to keep the resident microbial flora in between her toes intact, I mean, undisturbed. Why, you know, why was that advice given? I have no idea because it's contrary to what I would advise. Okay. I would advise them to use, uh, to use okay. soap to clean between their toes, but to dry well afterwards okay. because you don't want to build up a flora in between the toes. Okay. Yeah, because that's a good spot for bacteria and fungus to grow in between yes, the toes. Okay. So, so a mild uh, antibacterial soap uh, would be fine. Okay, I'm not thanks. sure why they said that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're very welcome. Uh, Dr. G, I have another question. Uh, this is John Tam. Um, what about your wife? Your wife was ahead of you. Oh, <laughs> you always is. Go ahead, Carol. <laughs> Good morning, Dr. Jeter. Hi. Hi. I had a pleasure of meeting you and uh, with my sister-in-law and your bedside manners. And I had already told Dr. Callender, you are fantastic. I um, wish we had met you sooner. And I was just wondering, all the advice that you gave was just not totally opposite of her podiatrist that was before you. And it was just I was just wondering, is there a way that you could have these check marks if a podiatrist described this and everybody else she has seen it said exactly the same thing that you did. But um, when she went to different to the hospital to get her toe amputated, every doctor has asked the same question that you asked, was she diabetic? And I kept wondering, don't they give a blood test or something rather than ask the patient or maybe the patient will give them a shortcut and there was one crucial question that no one ever asked, and it did apply to her. Were you a smoker? And um, how 
you know, even though she has quit within the past 10 years or something, how that really could have, she was a heavy smoker and how that could have been happened about um, the pain, you know, the nerves ending and the circulation. So um, don't, most doctors, they just ask that question, are you diabetic instead of getting the test? And I kept wondering, why aren't they just giving the test and answer that question for themselves? Well, they're asking it first to see if the patient will tell them so they won't have to order the test because then it's an added expense. And the patient tells them that they're diabetic and they're taking certain medications and all. That's just part of the history taken that they'll ask that question based on the symptoms that the patient has. And there's so many people that uh, don't know that they're diabetic and they are diabetic. So you're right to say that they should do the test, but they're asking the question first, just as part of being thorough. Oh, okay, and then there was a procedure that you had said that she should have been doing, especially when you have an infection of soaking your foot. And when the podiatrist told her that she should have been soaking her foot and um, could we have gone on internet or something before? <laughs> I mean, how do you know if you're being advised to do something that is really contrary to what's happening? That's a good question. I guess the best thing to do is get a second opinion or to ask someone that's in your circle that may have some other information, but uh, you, you were doing all the right things. Okay. And thank you. And thank you so much. I enjoy meeting you in person. You are fantastic. And you just calmed her down and she loved you immediately. So <laughs> thank you. You know, just exactly the right thing to say. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Sylvia Davis. Good morning, everyone. And thank you, Dr. Jeter. I had a question where you displayed the picture of the... Um, I think it was a young lady that had the nails way beyond the <laughs> shoes. And if an individual came to your office looking like that, what would you tell her in terms of if there are <laughs> problems with her feet um, later on? Which, which, well, what would you tell him? <laughs> <laughs> him? Yeah. yeah, what would you well, tell him? I want to know what Dr. G will tell the individual. <laughs> I would ask them why they were doing what they were doing. What was the purpose? Um, because it, it, it just, you know, that was sent to me from, from oh. someone that, uh, and I, I thought it was so interesting because first of all, the, the sandals were too small. <laughs> and, then, and then secondly, even just from a bacterial standpoint, the stuff that they were picking up underneath their nails and all, what was the, the purpose? I would ask them why they were doing that and try to educate them about the proper way, even if they wanted their nails a little longer, just to, put, to bring it back some, because it's just a, an accident waiting to happen. So the other follow-up is, why, why do the nails curve so? Sometimes in some individuals, the longer they get, the more they curve. Um, and I think that has to do with um, people wearing shoes and they have nowhere to go and the nail just curves. It happens a lot, um, especially on the second toe, more so than the other toes. I see it more on the second toe. Um, and it's not gender specific either. Um, it's, it's just the, the longer they get, the more they want to curve. Um, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Janice? Yes, good morning, Dr. Cheater. Uh, you are full of good information. Thank you. Um, I have neuropathy and I have constant numbness in my foot. Should I do anything special or is there any special care that I should give to that foot? Is it aggravated? No, it's numb. I feel the needles, the pen sticking through it. Uh, I think it I've gotten used to it and it's constant. Um, inspection, using your eyes uh, to compensate for the loss of feeling mm -hmm. um, is one thing. Patients say it tends to be worse at night because they become more sedentary. Activity will, some increase in activity will sometimes allow it to, to do better. Um, 
Is it one side? Night, yeah. At night, it gets cold. I yeah. literally have to get up and put a sock on. Yeah. 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 Um, have you have you tried anything for it? Have you done anything? Have you have you have you had your B12 level checked? Some vitamins? Oh, I went to a uh, neurologist and I've had many, many tests. I told Dr. Callender, I think I paid his rent for his building that year. He went through everything. And uh, yes, he found that my B12 level was extremely low. Uh, he could tell that I have poor eating habits. He could tell that I don't eat enough meat. So is all of that contributed to the neuropathy? Um, low levels of B12, um, neuropathy, can come from a diabetic, can come from back issues in the lower back. It can come from certain mineral deficiencies. Uh, There's a whole host of things that it can come from. It started um, with sciatica. I don't mean to cut you off. No, so that's the back fine. Yeah, the yeah. Hip. yeah, which I don't have now, thank goodness. Okay. It's just the foot. Yeah. B12, of course, is a common cause of neuropathy. Right. And I take that every day now. Has it helped? Um, I want to say it helped the um, sciatica. That was the worst nightmare, but nothing has helped the foot. I take it every day, a thousand milligrams. There's a topical uh, rub that's called capsaicin. Um, okay. It's over the counter. Uh -huh. um, I, I use that on a lot of patients that have the neuropathy. Um, it's, I'd say about 60% get better with it. You have to make sure you wash your hands after you use it or put it on with gloves because it, it has a pepper component to it that okay. if you touch your eyes or something, you can get burnt, uh, irritated from that. But you can try that. Start at the lowest level. CVS carries it too. It, it, you don't want the HP one. That's the high potency. Start out with just a regular capsaicin. Okay. And see how that does. All right, good. Thank you. Uh-huh. I'm sorry, what is the name of that product again? Capsaicin. Would you spell it? <laughs> C-A-P-S-A-S-I-N, I think it is. I've gotten they have a roll-on too. Yes, they do. They do have a roll-on. That's what I use. Capsaicin. Joyce, you're next. It's C A P C A P S A I C I N. Cream. Yeah, C A P S A I C I N. Put it in the chat. <laughs> Joyce, you're next. Thank you, Dr. Streeter. I really appreciate your discussion and your conversation about foot care. Um, in the past, I've had two toes where I had bone spurs and my podiatrist uh, recommended to um, remove part of the bone from those toes because um, it was a possibility that the bone spurs would return. So needless to say, um, those two bone spurs, one was in each of my baby toes. So I have, um, I don't have much posture in those baby toes, they're very flexible now. And I was wondering, is bone spurs, um, I know you didn't talk about bone spurs in your discussion, but um, how, what's the best treatment for bone spurs, especially in your feet? In the toes? Are you speaking specifically in the toes? Between the toes, and I also have um, on bone spurs on top of my feet. Okay. Um, it, 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 let's break it down to the toes. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes, uh, depending on how bad it's bothering the person, you can have a section of the bone removed um, in addition to lengthening the tendon a little bit and removing some of the skin so that the toe doesn't flop around or still has some stability to it. Sometimes uh, if you take out too much bone yeah. and not enough skin, uh, the toe will kind of flail or, or bounce around a lot. Um, if you have spurring on the top of your foot, it's usually related to the joints jamming together, um, usually due to some arthritic problem or excessive motion 
in the foot moving around. Um, it depends if it's if it's bothering the shoe, um, then um, you can have something to remove the spur that's actually causing it, but then you have to follow through and deal with the actual cause that started it in the first place. Uh, the spur is actually in result of something. So if the person's having too much motion in their foot and the joints are banging together like they would in a knee, a knee almost. Um, so you have to address both of the issues. Okay. Thank you, Well, They're not bothering me to the point that um, I song. would seek care or attention for them, but I will keep a close um, contact. Um, okay. Thank okay. you. Sure. Tom Buchan. Thank you so much, Dr. Jita, for your awesome presentation. So I, I have several questions. Um, I had um, fungus, nail fungus, really uh, badly that spread through through my toes, and I went to see a dermatologist, and he, he put me on um, uh, the uh, antifungal powder, uh, had me dry uh, off my my feet uh, after swimming and things like that. Uh, but the, the nail fungus uh, progressed. Then he put me on a, on a, a pill, I think an antifungal pill. He said, you know, we tried that for six months, I think. And then the, uh, you, you could see the nail get healthier and the fungus like grow out of the toe. Um, so I was just wondering if you have experience with that. I've got a, a black mark on the side of one of my toes now out of, out of nowhere. I don't know where it came from. I'm pretty sure it's fungus related. Um, and I, I have a couple follow-ups after that. Maybe you could talk about that. Sure. Um, the problem with treating the fungus is that you treat it as it exists. And we still put our feet back in the same environment where it comes from. So in addition to treating the, the nail or the skin, you need to treat the shoes too, because it's hanging out in the shoes. So I had a patient spray their shoes periodically with Lysol spray. And, and the fungus likes moist, dark places to grow like your bathroom shower or the bathroom floor, any place where it's moist. So whatever you use to clean those environments, you need to look on the back of the container, mm -hmm. see if it says it kills fungus, bacteria, and mold you need something that does that too because otherwise you just kind of keep transmitting it back and forth and people tend to not realize you go to a cookout you have on sandals there's fungus and mold in the grass so if you have a nick in your nail or a slight cut in your skin or a dryness of your skin it can get transmitted from the grass into your your nail or your skin too so that's why i was saying if you wear sandals and you come home you need to wipe your feet down and wipe the shoe down too. So those are things that you can do to prevent it. But I, I, I've had patients on all these things and they get better. And then it happens again because the same environment doesn't change. I understand. Thank you for that. Um, so you mentioned about sandals. Uh, I used to walk like five or six miles, three or four times a week. And uh, during the summer, I would wear sandals and my feet would just hurt so bad. And uh, turns out that I have flat feet. So I got uh, an insert. I want you to talk about inserts a little bit in the Good Feet store and stuff like that. But I super glued some inserts into my sandals and it made all the difference <laughs> in the world. You know, I could, I could walk without pain in my foot. You wanna talk about that a little bit? The inserts, the Good Feet store and all that. <laughs> Why, why don't you just wear tennis shoes with the inserts in them as opposed to a sandal? Well, yeah, I, I, I have tennis with the inserts, but okay, it, it, it was just during the summer, it was so hot, you know. Okay, okay. Because the, the, the shoes that, the, some of the tennis shoes have that mesh that the air can go through. The leather shoe is going to be warmer. Um, it's just that wearing a sandal and walking as an exercise exposes your toes to some form of trauma, uh, even uh, just because there's no protective barrier between your toes and the outside environment. So you need to be careful about that. Uh, uh, pebbles can get in between the sandal 
uh, glass, different things can get in between there. So you, 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 I understand what you're saying, but you just have to be very careful in that environment. Um, I'm not a, I'm not a, uh, uh, I, I, I don't know that much about the Good Feet store. I'm not a fan of anything. Um, if you don't go to CVS and buy your glasses, then why are you going someplace and getting your inserts? So that's, that's, that's all I'm going to say on that. I've actually had two patients who've gone there and had some complications uh, from going there. Um, and I'm not sure if it's because they were improperly fitted for something that they probably shouldn't have had or, uh, or what. So that's all I'm going to say on that because that's all the information I have. They real expensive too. Yeah, I understand. You can diagnose flat feet and recommend the proper uh, or what is, what is it called, orthotics? Well, the problem with a person who has a, a, a really flat foot that has functioned in that capacity, let's say we look at a clock. So their foot has been functioning at 12 o'clock, okay? And if you put the person in a really good orthotic, they're probably going to be functioning more at three o'clock. And most people can't tolerate that change that quick. So I start them off somewhere around 1.30 and try to build them up to being structurally controlled at three o'clock with that being our goal, but not starting just initially mm -hmm. um, um, because the, the body can't handle it because not only is it the flat foot, it's the knees that are, are being affected, the ankle, the hip, and the lower back also being affected in the change of that. So we try to gradually progress them to the end point. That's why we start out, they did some research looking at high-end orthotics versus $20 orthotics. And 50% of the people did good with the low end and the other 50% did good on the high end. So I start everybody on the low end because I know I'm going to help some people out. So, and then we progress further moving forward, but it, all of it depends on how flat their foot is too. And uh, last but not least, some of my toenails are really thick. Is there anything that I'm doing wrong or is that just genetics? Um, well, the thickness can be associated with the fungus too. Um, but I noticed that it doesn't necessarily have to. I think that as we get older, the, the nails tend to become thicker too because they've been ad adapted to an environment of the shoe and all the stresses of daily activity that you can have a thicker nail and not necessarily have a fungus in it as long as it's not creating a problem. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Joyce. Oh, Dr. G, I have one other question. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, I have high arches in my feet and I'm a firm believer of, in, of inserts. I use inserts in just about all my shoes that I wear uh, because they make my feet feel um, more comfortable and also my legs feel more comfortable. Can you recommend any um, activity or anything that um, could be done to help support high arches as opposed to low arches? When you say activity, uh, I'm not well, sure. Well, maybe not activities, but what I can do to um, be more concerned about my high arch. Um, I know I, I hear talk about people with low, low arches and what they can do, but what can a person with a high arch um, on their feet do? Usually, whether your arch is high or low, um, if, it's, if it's low in a, a very young person, mm -hmm. one becomes concerned during their developmental process. Same for high arch too. Um, but as we get older, if there's no pathology or symptoms associated with it, you're doing what you should be doing. You're bringing the ground or the floor up to you by putting the inserts in. Um, that, that, is, that is a good thing. Um, and protecting your foot is the best that you can do. Usually, um, a, 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 a female is easier to control in a high arch than a male because a male can't wear a slip-on as well. If they have a high arch, they have to tend to wear a lace-up shoe to support them because they can put the support in. But sometimes women who wear platforms or other shoes can bring the ground up to them and support them better. 
um, support is the best thing that you could do for a hierarchy, um, okay. especially if you're not having any, any other uh, symptoms with it. That's the best thing you can do, and you're already doing that. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Sylvia? <clears throat> Dr. Judy, you talked about, um, you know, when we go to these salons for pedicures that, you know, we need to bring our own instruments, which I'm sure most of us don't. Um, can you go to a podiatrist and get your, just your nails cut? correctly or if you have some pathology associated with it yes or you have some underlying condition for vascular uh, vascular disease diabetes uh <laughs>